Welcome to The Well, where we get together and talk about life and death and absolutely everything that comes in between. Uh, my name is Pastor Carrie, and my favorite fish fry fish is Lake Perch. My name is Pastor Tim, and my favorite form of art is Impressionism. My name is Jay, and my favorite brand of water bottle is Nelgene. Fantastic. All right, let's say hi to our fourth... Nope, first we're going to say hi to... A well, Mel just I, wants to I, cut I, off the jokes. I, I, I had just a... Um, a I, I just got done talking to a friend of mine. Um, he had a terrible time. He was, you know, those um, those shops, those game shops, they also sell calendars. Well, he stole a calendar. He got 12 months. <laughs> wow. It's almost yeah. a new definition of dad joke, that one. Yeah. Oh. So is it like is what what is the, the, what's one step worse than a dad joke like? I, we joke. might I don't know what but it might, we might be there. <laughs> a grandpa joke. A grandpa I don't joke. Know. Is that a thing? Maybe. <laughs> All right, let's say hi. Thank goodness, Mel, save us to our fourth. Hi, Mel. Member hi, of the Mel. team, Mel. He lives in the well where we gathered to talk about our different. Um, conversation topics and mel has lived down there a long time and has collected a lot of questions and discussion topics from everything he's overheard at the well just in case someone would like to come by sometime and have a discussion all right so mel's going to dive down the well for us and pick our first topic thanks mel here we go all right he did dive down deep that time all right it looks like he's got one here we go ah, perfect Thank you, Mel. Thanks, Mel. Oh, the double folds. Oh, he's... Oh, boy. Seatbelt's on. All right, here we go. After a national tragedy, there's often an outpouring of expressions of thoughts and prayers. Academic research indicates that the thoughts and prayers response is a uniquely American phenomenon. Research also shows that those who do pray after tragedies have more positive emotional states, fewer new mental ailments, and fewer intrusive thoughts about the tragedy. Research is inconclusive about effects on those who are being prayed for. How do you feel about this response? Does praying make a difference? All right, so I like this question because you feel like you know where it's going, and, mm -hmm. then, it, and then it absolutely kind of takes a turn, right? So the question really is, why do we pray? What's the purpose of prayer? And who does it change? And why do we do it? Right. Hmm. Um, I this is a this is a hard one for me because I've always had a little bit of sort of questioning when it comes to prayer. Um, I cannot deny that Jesus invites us into relationship with God the Father through prayer. Right. Tell the Father what you need. Um, does it? change God's mind to pray for things. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, and that's an interesting question. And then we get into the whole sort of chicken and egg thing about, well, what if both teams are praying for a victory? We, we does, if, if, you know, mm -hmm. is, um, and I, I can't help but feel that God probably doesn't get involved in that kind of stuff too often. Um, so I feel like there must be something about praying that changes us more than changes God. Um, and I wonder if what I've come up with, at least, which is something that has made sense to me recently, um, is uh, to lay things at the feet of God is to unburden myself but also to relinquish the illusion that I have that I'm controlling all of my circumstances. Mm. Um, and uh, to, to lay it down and leave it down is to, is to give up the, at least my constant reaction and need to be in control of everything and to manage everything. Um, so um, at least for me, what prayer does is help me practice laying things down and not feeling the need to be in control. Uh, I have a weird thing that happens to me. I, 
I shared it in a class once that um, when I do some type of prayers where I'm praying for somebody who might need healing or, or that, or I pray about something going on in their life, uh, many times, not every time, but many times, I'll get a call from that person in that day. Hmm. Um, so to me, there's something there, but also to me, when thoughts and prayers is used as an excuse for inaction, that's a heresy. Mm -hmm. And that sinful prayer, for me, brings about change in us. Um, and so if you're calling for thoughts and prayers, then that leads you to action, to actually do something about the situation. And we in our nation have become extremely good at saying thoughts and prayers and then going and playing golf. Yeah. And so um, prayer leads to action is what I believe. And without that action, without that being changed by our connection with God, then we're just being fools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um uh, Pastor Kerry, what you were saying with um, the idea that, you know, I, I, I asked the same question, I, and maybe I'll say it that way. I asked the same question of, does prayer actually change God? Um, I, I, I'm i going to go out and say I'm leaning towards a heavy I don't know or no um, personally, but I think, you know, prayer leads prayer leads us to, um, yeah, prayer prayer leads us to seeing something or relinquishing control or um, seeing where we can take action or helping us through through the love and grace of, of, of Christ to connect with each other. And so um, for me, I think this idea of thoughts and prayers, um, as it's, uh, you know, as I mainly see it and experience it in our American culture is um, that I'm not sure if it's, if it doesn't call us to connect and learn more about each other and connect to how God calls us to serve each other, um, create change in these tragedies, I'm not sure it is thought or prayer um, at that point. Um, and one of the thoughts, one of the things that was going through my mind was, you know, it's thoughts and prayer. And I think if we aren't thoughtfully praying, then we're really not doing either. Um, is, uh, yeah my my wonder on that but i i do think um i find it interesting in, the, in this question and in the info that comes with the question um i will say when i'm when i'm more intentional about my prayers i i i've i've said in other episodes that um you know anxiety is one of the mental health things that i i do um live with and, and work through um i will say when i'm very intentional about prayer um i i do feel less anxious um and i and i think that that has something to do with the connection of God. I mean, Jesus, at least you said, Pastor Gary, Jesus had something to say about it. Um, so I think there's something there. Um, I believe in the power of prayer. I just think the power of prayer is God then saying, um, then do something. Like, I've, you're connected to me, now let's get to work. Um, is, is maybe an answer to prayer that, unfortunately, I feel like we like to, um, yeah, go golfing or whatever um, on, so... I don't know. I, I think for me, like what's rolling around in my brain is, um, I've, I'm trying to stay focused on where you brought us, Pastor Kerry, is um, what what is the power of prayer. Um, but I, I'll just note that um, to be vulnerable for a minute, um, I actually I pretty much cringe when I hear the phrase thoughts and prayer now um, with the way that's been used. Um, I, I'll, I'll just say it out loud. I think it's. Um, it's, it's been used um, a lot of times to have inaction for um, things that directly affect um, my children be because of their skin color. So I, I think for me, um, it's it's hard to separate those. And so I'm thankful you were able to because I, I think it's it's important that we look at both and. But um, yeah. I think it's been used as a way to just sit back and do nothing. And then I, I struggle with that. I'm not sure that's prayer at that point. But that's that's me <laughs> unraveling a, t a tad it's bit at the end. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's grandstanding. Yeah, yeah. I would say too um, that also prayer can be an idol. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I've definitely uh, right when you're trying to force 
things to happen through aggressive <laughs> aggressive prayer or 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 you know depending on all I'm saying is um I think sometimes uh, prayer is instead of an invitation to put down the illusion of control is the uh, temptation to pick up prayer as a method of control which I just don't think was the point if, if I it may makes me sick. Mm. I hate to say that, but it really does. If if I may um, be, continue to be bold, <laughs> um, I think it can be used as a weapon to gain control yeah. um, oh, if we're not yeah. careful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah very interesting question. Wow. Lots of a- lots of aspects to that one. Yeah. All right. Well, Who? better never try. Mel, all right. Mel, go. Mel got us with that all one. Right. I feel like what's yeah. your favorite color would be? Like? Yeah. Like, <laughs> What is the biblical interpretation of the color pink? Like, that would be a good one, Mel. <laughs> We're voting for that one, Mel. Oh, here he goes. Maybe he's got it. There we go. Uh-oh. Oh, he got two. He got, he got two. a double. All right. We can just say that. Hold huh? that for the next one. We could. Maybe there's a reason. He got two. <clears throat> All right. Is it me reading it's, or? It's, wait. No, it's Either way. Reading. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you could take away all evidence culturally, spiritually, and historically of the ideas of heaven and hell, would the world be better or worse? Oh, my. Yeah. What? (laughs) If you could take away all evidence culturally, spiritually, and historically of the ideas of heaven and hell, would the world be better or worse? What if everyone just thought, we don't know what happens when you die? just must be who knows is maybe it's something maybe it's nothing um i would say that the world would be better uh i, I don't know it's it, it it it's hard to forget the amount again of damage and trauma that comes from threats of hell um i have known people who grew up in um predominantly Baptist churches, uh, who in their uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, on their deathbeds cannot let go of those ideas that they are about to go burn in hell or the fear mm. that they are or what did they, you know, all the things that they did wrong and probably that's, and, and this is people who left the church when they were even like, you know, young adults or even children uh the way that is is uh indoctrinated um into people in a way to control their behavior um is just so absolutely evil that i feel like i might be willing to sacrifice the image of heaven if at the same time i could get rid of hell i I don't know maybe i'd have to think about that a little longer but i'm maybe that would be true for me i i kind of look at it differently. Um, I know the threat of hell is there. I'm not limiting that. But I think the promise of heaven has created so much inaction in the church. You know, we're so, the old line, we're so heavenly focused that we're no earthly good. Hmm. Um, that, that promise of pie in the sky, not saying that's heaven, but that promise of that, that's your heaven, though, isn't it? Yeah, pie, pie in, in the, the sky. sky. <laughs> 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 what kind of pie? <laughs> Pecan. <laughs> but it's been used to say, well, your life is bad now, but you're going to get this promise. You know, that was uh, kind of used in slavery. It's been used with people who are impoverished. Right. Um, instead of heaven being a driving force for those who have to share with what they have for others, I mean, what does Jesus tell the young man when he says, how, how, do I, how do I get into the kingdom of God? Well, sell all you have and give it to the poor. No, I think I'll use that whole heaven thing to control the poor. How's that? Is that okay? Can I do that? So I, I, I actually think if we viewed faith as how we live our lives today and heaven as a marvelous gift that we get at the end, I think we'd be in better shape. Uh, and you might hear people say, oh, pastor, let's talk about Revelation. No, let's not. No, because that focuses us away from here, um, how it's taught, which is wrongly, but we'll talk about that another time. I think our focus is here, and that's why I'm so much into discipleship. 
not that it's a way of of um, receiving grace or meriting God's love, but it's a way of living out that grace and love. And it makes our earthly living, um, in a way, heavenly. Mm-hmm. Because right now, I think the church has made our earth as a whole, has made our earthly living for many hell-like. Yeah. Using that control. Yeah, so I, I, I think I'm, I'm just going to make both of you happy and say that I'm going to take both of your angles. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, 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 I like them um, as, as I, I'm happy I'm going third because I was pondering <laughs> what to say and what I thought about all of this. But I, I agree with both of you. I, I like the idea of both angles. And I think for me it comes down to um, because where Pastor Tim was going, we, we spend so much time looking. I'm saying we generally but we spend so much time looking at what happens next that we're, we have such little focus on what we're doing right now. Um, and um, I've, I've, well, I'll be careful. I say this, but I have, have personal interactions with watching family connections completely break down to where people are hardly talking because it's so based on um, trying to make sure that like there's this certain form of doing the right, whatever that list is to be done. So you're in this, you know, this view of heaven um, at the end that like the way that we're all treating each other is just so crappy. If I may say that. <laughs> I'm Christ like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> but um, you know, so it's just, um, I, I think for me, when I first heard it, I was like, I'll oh, take it all away. I like, there's a lot I believe in there, but then at the same time, I'm like, I think it would make it better. I think it would be more simple to getting back to um, living how Jesus calls us to live right here, right now. Um, think of the Lord's Prayer. You know, your 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 um, your will be done. And then um, you know, um, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done. And um, it, it it's not you know, as I enter, you know as we come into your kingdom from this place and that like your kingdom come, your kingdom is constantly coming to us as earth and in heaven as in earth, earth as in heaven. As right. In heaven, yeah. Um, so that combo of the both, um, yeah. that the, the idea of heaven and, and, and hell just being this thing that, um, yeah, come, pass, I think past carry, you know, that comes down to control no matter which direction we take it. Right. I agree. Um, and the final thought I had was actually, um, um, I mean, I feel the same way, but Pastor Kerry, um, just says it, says it so eloquently and helped our confirmation class make this shift too. um, is when Jesus tells parables, um, most of them are started with the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like, yeah. and then he talks about things that are, hap- that are happening on earth. Um, and yes, there are little lessons we can learn, right? But at the end of the day, it's, what is the kingdom of God like? Um, if Jesus spent that much time talking about it, <laughs> maybe we should change our focus a little too. That being said, I, shall we gather at the river is one of my favorite hymns. And I think the image of gathering with the saints at the river, flowing by the throne of God is something that gives me hope when I don't have it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, right. Yeah. It's a good point. I mean, all saints Sunday is so meaningful to me personally. And I think to yeah. the church that, you know, that uh, we do live in this both hands, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that you know, I, I'm just saying. I, I think what we're saying is the misuse of right. the promise of heaven or the threat of hell mm-hmm. by the church is really yeah yeah. Um, so reality is, if if we didn't have any concept of it, it would be more simple, probably. Yeah, well, yeah, and and like you said, you, we, we, there would there be no temptation for humans to use power over others um, mm. with the excuse of heaven and hell. Which I mean, right. you know, we could go on. Yeah. On and on. Th- I mean, even just think about the harm that is caused to people in the in the. Uh, I'm going to save you from yourself because you're going to hell, right? Yeah, okay. and I've I mean, decided and, that for you. And right? that's what love means to some people. No, this is I'm loving you as I would love myself. I don't want to go to hell, which means I am going to condemn your lifestyle so that you realize how bad it is to save you from hell, right? right? Or or going even back to. The past of the church where be baptized or die uh, yes mm-hmm. you know, or how many <laughs> more extreme how right. many yeah. wars were yeah. fought 
the Anabaptists, the, yeah. you know, Martin Luther said, you, you know what? I think they just need to die. They're just, they're not doing the right thing. And it's probably better to kill them all and let God sort them out. Who knows? Who knew that Martin Luther was the first one who said that? No, he didn't say he that. He didn't say he that. He did not no. say that. No. <laughs> he acted that, but he, he act, did not yes, say he that. He acted it, but he, he maybe, he didn't say it in English in any case. Yeah. <laughs> in any case. But Jesus did. No. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> no, it. Well, all right. Mel gave us a double, huh? Mel gave us a double. So who's reading this one? Do I read it? Okay, cool. Okay. How does your religion reinforce feelings of safety, if at all? How does it encourage adherence to respond to a perceived threat? One more time. How does your religion reinforce feelings of safety, if at all? How does it encourage adherence to respond to a perceived threat? Well, one of the reasons I don't uh, run is because I want to be able to stand and face my threats and not run away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, can, I, might, I might have to have that one in front of me when I answer. Yeah. Um, I, I know that when... When I allow myself to be focused on grace and faith, um, I'm more courageous. Um, but sometimes I, I mean, I'm trying to think of what the threat would be. I mean, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a grizzly bear, we're getting that heaven thing because basically I'm going to be going to see my maker, and that's it. But <laughs> if it's somebody, if it's somebody um, in conflict, I try to I try to pull back. I don't always do it, but I tr try to trust in faith and see this as not something I have to battle. But um, I. I've always been a chicken, though, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Can I see it again? Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, Jim. You want me to take a stab at it? Take so, a stab at it. I think. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say it. Um, I, I actually, um, if I made this conversation, I had with us, but I had a really good one with with you about this a while back, and um, I'm at this point in my life. Um, personally with faith and, and in faith leadership, um, specifically overall church youth leadership, but especially, especially with youth. Um, I, I think the idea of safety is, 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 um, a kind of a falsehood. Um, if we're really digging into faith and digging into our religion, religion, I don't think that's always safe. So I, I, I'm just going to be bold for a minute. I, I think, for instance, for me, um, you know, just being able to come back from an amazing summer worth of experiences. And, um, you know, some of the conversations we have for certain youth are not going to feel safe. I can't, I can't guarantee safety. I can't promise it. I can't even commit in any form to the fact that when we talk about some of the stuff, it's going to feel safe. I can talk, I can, I can say based on my, um, commitment as, um, you know, uh, fully believing that there's nothing that separates us from um, Christ's love, um, which, it, it, as you all are learning, is, is definitely um, a Bible verse that I lean on a lot. <laughs> um, but this concept yeah. that there's nothing that separates us from Christ's love, I can guarantee you that that's going to be the basis. Um, yeah. But when we dig into that, when we pull the veil off of things in our lives, it's not going to always feel safe. So I, I think I've grown the most in my christian or yeah my understanding of christian faith and in my personal faith i think i'm growing the most when i haven't felt safe um i agree in 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 not like intentionally hurtful stuff right like i i think i th i want to define that really carefully for this podcast i'm not saying like when people come after me and like oh you think this or that like there are certain things that just feel harmful and hurtful like i, I want to be clear like that that's not right um okay. but um, similar to Pastor Tim's story, um, I, I left the church I was in because I was told, well, I'm the pastor, you just have to accept this. And I was like, I just, 
want you to help me like learn how to read this scripture in this way. Like maybe we're going to agree on it, but I just want to ask the questions and I wasn't allowed to ask questions. That was harmful. Mm -hmm. Asking questions and pondering how that hits real things in our life might not always feel safe, but we can guarantee that we're going to love and care for each other, enter it with grace and enter like a brave space. It might not always be a safe space. Um, so I'm really caught on that word safety, obviously. <laughs> um, um, so I, I think perceived threats would be, um, for me, if, if I'm grounded in, in, in Christ, um, I, I don't think it's always going to feel safe. So I think that it's inherent that there's going to be things that are going to threaten me or feel harmful. But if I'm grounded in, in, in the grace of God um, to help me and those I'm walking alongside or, you know, those that are walking with me, that we can do that together, um, then, then I'm okay with that. I don't know if that made sense at yeah. all. I kind of rambled. I'm sorry. But. Definitely, definitely. <clears throat> um, so, the definition of a cult, right, is a is a is a um, religious framework that is based on something other than scripture and God, right? So, mm -hmm. if that's a, a definition that um, my seminary taught me. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the so in that way, for example, Christian science is a cult because mm -hmm. it is not it's based on the writings of a human being, right? And the teachings of one human being and not on sort of scripture and, and those kinds of things. So um, I would say another definition of cult would be uh, a group of people that leverages fear mm -hmm. to control their adherence. The more fear you have and engender in your group of people, the closer you are to a cult and the farther away you are from from worshiping the true God. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say there are plenty of religious factions of all different kinds whose main focus is to scare the people into doing whatever they want them to do, whether that means going Tr to going somewhere well you know all the things that mm -hmm. that people are scared into doing um jesus didn't scare us jesus didn't come to try and scare us jesus right. didn't leverage our fear um to control us and to get us to do what jesus wanted to do right jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free right that yeah. is the opposite of fear um so, uh, and that being said, um, Jesus also says those who lose their life um, will find it. Those who love their life will lose it, right? I mean, Jesus is, is not all about our idea of uh, controlling our, de our destiny and mm. um, being comfortable in our armchairs and that kind of thing, right? right. I think Jesus was uh, especially um, motivated by... Um, turning the values of the world upside down, but doing so in freedom, right? And I think you're absolutely right, Jay, in the freedom that nothing will separate us from the love of God, right? That is a freeing statement when we say right. that we're freed of the fear. We don't take on more fear. Right. So those are my thoughts on that. I think... Um, Closer. I think... Uh, um, <laughs> sorry. I think about when I, as I reflect on this more, like when I start a new call, I never feel safe. Right. Um, a lot of things that I do, I never feel safe, but I feel secure. Mm. And I think there's something in that that doesn't mean I'm not going to get hurt. Um, it just means that I'm going to go through this and whatever the outcome would be. Um, I like what Pastor Kerry said a lot about the cults, and I just got done watching a show on Jonestown. Uh, <gasps> and mm. that was definitely it. Yeah. Getting people to fear, and I think... The do not be afraid is exactly. so important. Um, I like that almost every time an, uh, a heavenly being, an angel, encounters a human, the first thing they say is don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think, I, think, I think safety isn't important. I know I joked about it earlier, but it's... Yeah. Well, I think, and you know, you said before about revelation, right? Most people use revelation to scare other people. Mm -hmm. That is a very common uh, uh, interpretation of that book, right? Oh, which there are there's a whole series of books about. Yeah, it. Mm -hmm. which I feel like, man, I 
I don't love that Revelation is included in our scripture because I feel like it's like giving babies matches. Okay, or a lighter, right? Yeah. Babies can't light matches. Their babies are, no, don't give your baby matches. But I, <laughs> it's not easy for them to light it. A lighter is what I'm saying. Because <laughs> uh, they're going to light everything on fire. Like right. That's what giving the book of Revelation is giving it to this generation of people alive on earth today. It's like giving a baby a lighter. And it's actually a political book more than a religious book. Yeah. So, all oh right. You know what that says to me? It <laughs> says Texas, <gasps> which also reminds me. <laughs> Do you want to dig into that or just let that one roll? <laughs> it, it reminds me of Texas caviar. Love, luckily enough, Pastor Tim, would you like to tell us what you made for your recipe? Well, today? this is, um, oh. it's interesting that um, the St. Luke's cookbook and the first Lutheran, my first call, Cookbook both have many Texas caviar recipes. And I know my wife Betty got hers from the first Lutheran one. So this is it, except for I couldn't find one of the right beans, so we got a little oh larger uh, um, white bean. But um, yeah, um, this is it. Hopefully it's, it's good. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. I, I spilled it, but not because it was bad, but because I took too much because I love it. <laughs> first time I had this was in Texas. I had never heard of it before. Really? Yeah. Um, and I couldn't, I, I loved it. I couldn't believe I'd never, I've never had it before. And I'd never had had black eyed peas before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're deli and I love it. It's del it the is jalap delicious. The jalapenos come from our garden. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Cool. My peppers aren't ripe yet. I've got some serranos that are working. Mine, mine didn't get planted. So I've always heard this called cowboy caviar, mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. which is, I, I don't know why. Um, but I've also had it with avocado Yum. in there as well, okay. sometimes corn. Mm -hmm. There's um, normally corn in it, but um, I'm not a corn fan. Mm. I don't like so. corn in mine either. Um, but I have put avocado in it, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But that's not what was in this recipe. So New metal's not for everybody, I get it. Yeah, I wanted to go there too. <laughs> Um, are we only allowed to break down by half? No, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to go 4.75. Mm. Wow. Mm. Um, I, re I really like it. I think I'm going to go 5. I just feel like I don't know where this is. I mean, uh, it's it's just delicious. Even, like, I had a r pretty spicy pepper there. Like, I, um, some of those have I have a confession to make. This morning, I decided to change the recipe, and I added cayenne pepper to it, which is what we normally do. Mm, it's good. So, yeah. It's good. I, I like hot, so. So what are you giving it, Pastor Tim? Oh, this is one of my favorites, so it has to be a, a five. Oh, I'm going to give it a 5.2. I want to give the 4.75 just because I think it does. For me, I want corn. I want avocado. Yeah, I know. I know. But um, but no, I I'll still give it a 5. It was absolutely in, in the world of are you picking this up at the at the potluck? Oh, yeah. Every single time. I'm, actually, I'm going back for a second. I'm yeah, taking the bowl. <laughs> um, actually, I have a confession to make. I was supposed to buy there's um, the pico corn. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I normally put in it. Um, but they didn't have that in the recipe. And the other reason it didn't go in, because I did play with the recipe, is I forgot to buy it at the market when I went last night. <laughs> so that's why I know corn. Yeah. It's, I'm, I, I think would have added it. For, for me, I like it because, um, you know, it's uh, you either have, like, authentic, like, um, you know, actual authentic salsa or you have like all the stuff in the store and then you have this where it's like takes away all that like tomato pasty mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff yeah, that's so, that, so and fresh, it's just right? it's just fresh it's mm -hmm. real it's it's um i really like it i know it's not technically a salsa but um, it's great i would salsa. use it as one though i would put that on a taco oh yeah i would put that on a chip mm -hmm. we ate it with chips and it was delicious mm -hmm. so put, put that on nachos yeah. i mean i'm yeah and when i get to the bottom of the cup I always drink it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah putting it in a little cup, cup was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> Absolutely. Now. Change man. <laughs> All right. Well, luckily, we've already eaten because I'm about to share my God moment. Uh-oh. The background to this moment is you mu- does anybody know what a fly's mouth parts are called? <laughs> okay, you have to know this for the story. Okay. okay. It's called a proboscis. Okay. Oh, it's like that. a thing that comes now that you down. Say, I mean, I've heard the word now that you say it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. So last night, Ellie and I, uh, my Matt is, my Matt is um, <laughs> on a camping trip. And so Ellie and I have been batching it. And we went outside last night for a little walk after dinner. And we have some chairs out on our front sort of like stoop thing. And it, it, it just so happens that our neighbor's cat often sits on those chairs. And what happens when a cat often sits on those chairs is that often a cat throws up on those chairs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's sort of the, our neighbor cat's vomitorium. And also his name is Mr. Smithers. So it's Mr. <laughs> Smithers' vomitorium. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And so as we were walking out the front door last night to go on our walk, I glanced over at the vomitorium, and there's just this horrifying pile of I don't know what, but something has eaten something and yeah. then given it back. And if any of the people out, out there are um, Stranger Things fans, the best way I can describe this is season two Mind Flayer as the Mind Flayer is coming together, right? This looks like a little piece <laughs> of how that mind flare comes together right so it's just like the worst thing <laughs> ever i mean we look at it, it's like ah i mean it's like a, a home alone moment like we look yeah. at each other we scream they like run in the way and i when we got back then because i'm just worrying about it the whole time oh it's not i don't know what to do with no, it it's no, so no, huge no, no, no. go ahead <laughs> it, no it's just it's so big and we're just worried about it and so when i when we got home i actually just took the one of the chairs and turned it so that I couldn't really see it anymore. And yeah. um, when my mat comes home, he'll have to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> that <laughs> is I awesome. I love this. I was it, so afraid you're going to say when you came home, it was gone as if another critter <laughs> oh. came and ate it. Or if that it really was <laughs> part of the mind. Fight, right. right? Uh, oh. No. So uh, we came home and I turned the chair so I couldn't see it. I was like, that's good enough for now. We'll, you know, we'll figure it out. And, um, I, but I'm still worried about it. Like, I know it's out there, right? I know it's in my front door, even though I can't see it. There's nothing. Yeah. I just, and I, there's kind of flies on it and stuff. I'm sorry. I know it's so bad. No, this and is so awesome. I, and so I was just like, all right, I, I'm getting, wor- I'm getting like worked up. I'm getting upset. Uh, there's, I feel like there's nothing I can do. I can't like take care of it because I don't know what to do. And, and Ellie had gone into her room at that point and I was just like, oh, I know. <sighs> right now on that thing are all kinds of God's creatures, right, doing their jobs to to do the circle of life. Um, it's a perfectly natural process. I might think it looks gross, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, but everything is happening out there the way it's supposed to happen in yeah. the world that we live in. So I walked into Ellie's room. And I was like, oh, I know, because I was I thought she was probably worried about it too. <laughs> probably it was only me, but I was like, here's <laughs> how we're gonna look at this. Here's what we're gonna think about this. Here's how we're gonna sleep tonight, knowing even that that thing is outside, is that there's all kinds of flies on it right now going, God's work, our purpose guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Are we gonna make shirts? <laughs> For those people who aren't as familiar, <laughs> <laughs> for those people who aren't as familiar, yeah, that's one of the ELCA's things: is God's work, our hands. Uh, so this is the flies, the flies version. God's work, our purpose. Yes, actually, this is amazing. Bumper. Yeah, <laughs> it's on my um, and that is amazing. <laughs> you telling the story is my current God moment. <laughs> Thank you for journeying to the well with us as we all have God's work on our hands. Let us go in peace. In God's name. The Well is a podcast of St. Luke's ELCA in Middleton, Wisconsin. You can follow for new episodes airing every other Thursday on St. Luke's website or wherever you get your podcasts. If you would like to drop a question in the well, you can dive over to stlcaorg slash the well to submit your questions there. The Well is sponsored by St. Luke's Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to leaving a legacy for future generations. You can learn more at stlukes-elca.org slash foundation. Thanks for listening, and we'll meet you next time here at The Well.